Blog Talk Radio. Thanks for tuning in to Fire Engineering Talk Radio. Each week, our host will introduce you to a various cast of characters you will only find here. Each host will share experience, knowledge, and expertise regarding their years in the fire service, allowing you to call in and speak with them live, an experience you can only find on Fire Engineering Talk Radio. So thanks for joining us. Enjoy and stay safe. Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, or good morning, or whatever the time is when you happen to be listening in. I want to welcome you to another installment of Fire Engineering Fire Talk Radio in the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. I'm your host, Tom Merrill, and thank you for joining me this evening. Today is Tuesday, July 21st, and I want to thank you for spending some time with me and talking about this great fire service of ours And this is a show that is dedicated to our great fire service, specifically the great American, or across the world, I should say, the great volunteer fire service, where we discuss areas of concern and the great success stories and the challenges experienced and being faced by the volunteer fire departments throughout the world. And again, we continue to reinforce that message that being a volunteer firefighter in no way means you cannot be a professional firefighter at all. I certainly hope you're enjoying these dog days of summer. We're well in the summer now. Hope you're enjoying these warm months. And I've been traveling a little bit, going through the great state of New York and some other areas. And you know what jumped out at me right away is I love going through the small towns. I love going through the communities. And I saw lots and lots of signs out there talking about the local volunteer fire department picnic or the local volunteer volunteer fire department field days or the local volunteer fire department chicken barbecue and it always gets me thinking again it's a great reminder of just the great things that the volunteer fire companies are doing all across the world connecting with their community doing these types of events inviting the public in very important purpose of course is hopefully to raise some extra money and be able to purchase some much-needed equipment, update some much-needed things at the firehouse or on the apparatus. But, again, I think about how, as volunteers, you come in from the field, you come home from your day job, you come home from that 12-hour day at the office and take care of your home, take care of your family, and then you run off to your local volunteer firehouse to take care of all these other things that need to be done And this was a reminder of the extra activities we do, the field days, the fun drives, the chicken barbecues, the picnics, part of it for fun, part of it to connect with the community, but also another real part of it to hopefully just raise a few extra bucks to help out. And uh, while traveling around, I was reminded of that. I saw many, many signs from many, many volunteer fire departments around uh, the New York State area where I've been going. And uh, just great, uh, great to see that and and see some of these people and stop out and talk to them. And uh, just so many great people out there. And uh, all that was a great reminder of the great things we do. Oh, yeah, we train and go to fire calls and emergency medical calls and rescue calls too, don't we? But we do so much, so much more than that. It's a great fire service and every now and then just take a step back and appreciate where you come from appreciate where your department came from a lot of hard work went into making it what it is and we need to step back and realize what a great service we do provide and how our communities depend on us and talk about all these great things we do for the communities and just how great being part of the fire service is part of your department and part of the fire service speaking of the fire service i encourage you feel free to call in tonight Uh, Feel free to talk about whatever's on your mind concerning the volunteer fire service. Talk about this message we're trying to convey that consider being professional, nothing to do with a check at all, nothing to do with earning a paycheck. So feel free to call in at 1-760-454-8852. We're going to have a great show tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about highway safety, and I'm very excited to have a guest on it. I'm going to introduce in a little bit who's very passionate about training and getting the word out about being aware of how dangerous being up on the highways is and then talk about steps we can take to help prevent 
injuries and fatalities and accidents on these highway incidents. So it's going to be a really, really good show, and I want to thank you for listening in. And thanks for everybody also for reaching out to me and contact, connecting with me and my email account, which is tamerrill63 at aol.com or on Facebook. And, hey, speaking of Facebook, big news, big information. If you haven't noticed, uh, a lot of people asked me to do it. I finally got around to it. I'm not the most technical guy, but I finally launched a professional volunteer fire department Facebook page where I will be putting sharing stories that you might see some of these stories on some of the national publications, but I'll share them if they pertain to the volunteer fire service or are important to us. And then I'll also find things and put other things on there as well that maybe you haven't seen. And uh, I encourage you to check it out, friend me, leave your comments, and um, it's a great way to reach out. Lots of new friends I've already reached through Facebook. So check it out. The Professional Volunteer Fire Department is on Facebook. And my own personal Facebook page is Look it up, Tom Merrill. I have nothing to hide. Feel free to friend me. I'd love to friend you back. You might see pictures of my kids every now and then or see that I'm on a vacation, but feel free to reach out to me. I love to connect with all the great firefighters that are spread out across the world and talk and share issues and, again, uh, celebrate the success stories as well. And also I'm on Twitter. Feel free um, uh, to send me uh, uh, some things on Twitter. So you can find me on, I think, most of the major media publications that are out there and uh, I encourage you to do that so tell me what's going on in your department in your community and uh, we got lots to talk about and speaking of what's going on in the great fire service let's talk about some of the recent headlines that come across the newswire affecting the volunteer fire service or the fire service in general and uh, again I'm pretty big on health and wellness although being on vacation the last couple weeks I need to get back to the gym and a lot of grilling and eating and (laughs) things like that. But again, um, talking about health and wellness, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the latest stats came out for firefighter fatalities in 2014. And I don't want to say it's a surprise, but it continues to be a little bit of an alarming trend that the cardiac issues, again, claim the majority of firefighters in 2014. The good news, the good news is we're losing less or we lost less in 2014 than in previous years. In 2013, we lost 97 of our brothers and sisters. And in 2014, we had 64 firefighters who uh, died in the line of duty. And uh, more than half, more than half were victims of sudden cardiac events. And that's the highest number, unfortunately, since 2008. And out of those 64, 34 were volunteer firefighters. Um, Now, crashes are down, which is good. That's usually the second most uh, fatalities are related to crashes, but that that was low. There were only seven last year. And the other thing that's interesting is 22 of the fatalities occurred on the fire ground, and that's the second lowest number of fire ground deaths since these stats started being compiled in the late 1970. But it's also the third time in the last five years that we've got the number of deaths on the fire ground below 25. So we are making trend, we are making progress. 64 still way too many, but at least it's not 97 like it was in 2013. And if we can get a handle on these sudden cardiac events, hopefully, and I think you'd agree with me, we can get that number to drop much lower than 64. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to establish health and wellness programs. We need to work together to try and reduce the number of sudden cardiac events. You know, we need to to work out together. Even if you don't have a gym at the firehouse, your department can't afford a gym membership, there's still so much we can do. And that'll be, again, the topic for future shows. But at least be aware. Let's start with the awareness. This is still such a major epidemic in the fire service, and we need to get the trend down. But, again, the good news The number of fire ground deaths is certainly low, lower than it's been in quite a while. Hopefully we can keep that going down as well. And speaking of health and wellness, uh, there were some scientists from the University of Texas, and they're doing a study, and they're looking for volunteer or mostly volunteer fire departments uh, to be available to participate 
in a test of an online wellness program that they're putting together for volunteer firefighters. It's a FEMA-funded project, and they're going to study the usefulness and acceptability of these programs um, with departments across the country. So they're looking for volunteer departments or actual or mostly volunteer companies to participate. And if you are interested in that, um, there's an email address here that I would be happy to send you. Reach out to me on Facebook or at tamerrill63 at aol.com. I'd be happy to send you the contact info. But, again, I think that's great. Uh, they're looking to put together an online health and wellness program, and they're looking for volunteer fire companies to participate in this FEMA-funded project. Again, Maybe you don't have a lot of money. Maybe there's you can't afford gym memberships or a gym in your firehouse, but maybe there's something here that would be of interest to you that could help your members out. Um, it's, again, health and wellness related. You know, the National Volunteer Fire Council is always doing so much for the Volunteer Fire Service, and they now have a webinar available right online uh, designed to educate first responders on the epidemic of cancer. Boy, we're full of good news in the volunteer fire service, aren't we? The epidemic of cancer in the fire service. It's a growing epidemic. So the National Volunteer Fire Council, they've released a new on-demand webinar. It'll raise awareness in the fire service about the risks we're facing as first responders and also offer tips and best practices for lessening the risks and hopefully preventing this terrible, terrible illness. And that's available right through the National Volunteer Fire Council's website. It's available as a virtual classroom, and it's free, people. It's free, probably one of the best words we like in the volunteer fire service. And if you're paying attention to what's going on in the fire service like we should, again, Health and wellness, huge. If you've been watching what's going on in Illinois, the collaborative effort and research project that's being taken on by the Illinois Fire Service Institute, where they're testing the contaminants we get on our gear, the contaminants that get on our skin. They're monitoring the gases that are being created as the furniture and carpeting and other things are burning. So a great study being done by these PED scientists at the Illinois Fire Service Institute working in collaboration with fire service professionals from around the United States, and they're going to have a lot of great information that they're releasing. They're setting up all sorts of equipment to monitor these things. They're going to be educating us, passing on this information that they're learning. But people, what do we already know? What do we know? We don't have to be told anymore. Fighting fires is a dangerous job. We know that, and it's also exposing us to some serious bad stuff. Carcinogens on your gear, on your skin. Wash up. Wash your gear. Wash your hood. Take your helmet line it out and clean that as well. We can't say it's not happening. It is happening. The studies are showing it. And luckily, there's people out there doing even more research, and they're going to be educating us even more on steps we can tell, take to help limit our exposure and limit and prevent and lessen the number of us getting affected by this terrible, terrible disease. And again, you know, speaking of that National Volunteer Fire Council, I encourage you all to go online and join. Um, it's a great organization, and they just received accolades for another program they put together. And again, we talked about health and wellness, but heart attacks, um, they also have a program now that's trying to help responders who need help because they're just not feeling right or they're they're just feeling down, um, and it's a phone call away. And it's uh, focusing on behavioral health issues, and it's a free confidential fire and EMS hotline, and that help is available at 1-888-731-FIRE. And the National Volunteer Fire Council has videos that highlight the importance of um, this number and the importance of helping those that need help due to behavioral health issues, which is another I don't want to say new, but I think it might be kind of new. It's just recently come out that a lot of firefighters, a lot of first responders are having problems, are having behavioral health problems. 
and the National Volunteer Fire Council, among many other people, have recognized this and are putting resources together to try and help our brothers and sisters out. And again, um, if you need help or know somebody that needs help, you can refer them to this number or use this number, one eight 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 seven three one fire and uh, there's also more information on the National Volunteer Fire Council on the website at www.nvfc.org. And if you put hash, uh, slash help, it'll take you to the information on behavioral health issues and how you can get some help for our brothers and sisters that need it. And again, the National Volunteer Fire Council always doing so much. They put a resource guide together that's meant for the fire family members of our volunteer members joining the service. And it talks about joining the volunteer fire service and what it means in type in um what it means in terms of lifestyle change, not just for the volunteer firefighter, but how the family might be affected by it as well. And this brochure is called What to Expect, a guide for family members of volunteer firefighters. Again, it's available through the National Volunteer Fire Council website. You can print a copy. You can order it from their store. And for a limited time only, National Volunteer Fire Council members can order up to 25 print copies for free. And again, information on the National Volunteer Fire Council website for what to expect, a guide for family members of volunteer firefighters. Great idea, because it is a culture that we join when we join our volunteer fire service and sometimes our family don't understand families don't understand what what it involves and what's going on what we're getting into so i would check that out i would check that out and one last thing on the national volunteer fire council uh, they also put a page together called the right to volunteer and this was created and it's intended as information, an informational resource for volunteer emergency responders who find themselves under pressure to give up or reduce their involvement in volunteering. Hopefully the page is useful for members of the general public who are also interested in volunteering. And there's a lot of great information on there. And again, I encourage you to check it out. It's called the Right to Volunteer and uh the Volunteer Advocacy Committee is hoping to address not only some of the issues, but also any of the impediments to volunteering. And uh, if some volunteers are being pressured to give up or reduce their volunteer activities, uh, this advocacy group might be able to help. They want to know about it, and they, they encourage you to contact them, offer suggestions about what the site could entail to help people out, share stories. And again, the National Volunteer Fire Council just trying to help and they put a page together, the right to volunteer, and you can find it right on their website. And I encourage you to check that out. What else is going on in the fire service news? Well, if, unless you had your head buried in the sand, I'm sure last month you were uh, watching on the news the story of the two escaped convicts from the Clinton Correctional Facility right here in good old New York State, two murderers who escaped from jail and were gone for several weeks being tracked down by law enforcement, and it indirectly affected a local volunteer fire department. And I wanted to share that story just in case you didn't know. But the local volunteer fire department that found itself right in the middle of the search for these escaped convicts in a town had to shut down their main fundraiser for the year, which was a popular field day parade and we talked earlier about how these parades and field days and barbecues are fundraisers for volunteer firehouses and this fire department it's the Katyville volunteer fire department and it was also their 50th anniversary which as you know is a milestone event and they've been planning for over a year on how to make it a great event and they had it all set the date was set and it happened to fall right in the middle of the search for these escape killers, and they had to close it down. And that cost them a lot. And so the call went out to help them because the food was gone, the rides were canceled, their world-famous clam chowder wasn't available. More importantly, their funding was cut. So a request was sent out. People were asked to send whatever they could send to help out the Katyville Volunteer Firefighters because they could not have 
their annual fundraiser, their annual parade, their annual field days, and people responded. And I just heard uh, Chief Goldfeder reported on uh, the firefightersclosecalls.com that they've raised or they've got donations so far around $7,300, and they're still coming in. And you know what they're doing with that? They're immediately putting that, they're designating that money as a fundraiser for a new thermal imaging camera to replace their first-generation camera. So out of some tough times comes some good news because people step forward. Got to imagine a lot of volunteer firefighters step forward to help out the Katyville Fire Department in Katyville, New York. Good. That's a good feel-good story that I just wanted to share with you. Conversely, something that I talked a little bit about on the last show is we love to celebrate and we love to talk about all the good that is going on in the volunteer fire service and in the fire service in general. Yet when I read something like this, I get so mad. And it just came out a few weeks ago that there are volunteer fire departments out there that are scamming the retirement systems, which are taxpayer-funded retirement systems. Um, there's many there's volunteers that have been reportedly not responding to enough calls or holding proper certification whatever they're doing they're just not following the letter of the law as it was written as it was intended to recruit and retain members and it makes us look bad it gives us a black eye you know these municipalities are making deposits into these accounts for the volunteer firefighters Members can earn this money at a certain entitlement age. All that's required is that they meet minimum certification or minimum qualifications, go to a certain amount of calls, maintain a certain percentage, maintain a certain training, whatever the municipality says. And it just came out in some areas, again, that some are scamming this system. And and that gives us all a black eye. And uh, I would just like to say that we need to make sure, you know, people look at us, As the integrity people, we have integrity. And if you don't have integrity, you don't have anything. And we need to make sure that we educate our members and we hold them accountable. And as boards and as groups, we explain to people what requirements are, and in this case, what the requirements are to earn this retirement. And then we hold people accountable. And if they don't earn it, they don't get it. Because every time these reports come out, it gives us a black eye and the public looks down on us. And we certainly don't do that. Over in Nebraska, the Supreme Court issued a ruling which is going to throw a monkey wrench into some operations. Uh, Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Nebraska Supreme Court issued a decision that concerns a lawsuit. And it may change the way emergency personnel and government officials respond to some calls. What happened? About five years ago, a woman in a county in Nebraska had it was involved in a serious auto accident. And what happened is you know, there was some corn mash that was spilled on the road. The fire department came, cleaned up the mess, but some of the corn mash was still on the side of the road. This poor lady, 24 hours later, drove through it, lost control of her car. She swerved into a ditch and was seriously injured. I believe part of her arm had to be amputated. So lawsuits ensued, and originally uh, the, the, the courts ruled that uh, the fire district and municipalities couldn't be sued and they were protected, uh, and that was appealed in the Supreme Court in Nebraska just ruled that political subdivisions can be sued. So people are saying that this is going to change the way some volunteer fire departments respond to calls. Maybe they won't go to a cleanup, and it's going to cause some issues as to who's responsible. Is it the tow operator, law enforcement, the fire department? No one's going to go up there because it could always be said that it wasn't cleaned up properly if, God forbid, something happened. And something did happen, and it was a terrible accident, and she was seriously hurt. But the Supreme Court ruling here is going to change the way some people look at responses to accidents and cleanup and uh, very interesting and uh, that was in our the great state of nebraska our junior programs continue to get great news we did a show on that a couple of uh, months ago and again just a story zipping across the fire wire uh, back in june where another 16 year old firefighter saved a life a junior firefighter in pennsylvania was playing baseball 
He's actually uh, just hit a double. He's racing across towards second base, and the poor umpire collapsed. And this young 16-year-old saw that he was in cardiac arrest and performed CPR. Uh, this is Michael Brodzinski, 16-year-old junior, junior firefighter from Delaware County in Pennsylvania. He's a member of the Darby Fire Company Number 1 and also the Sharon Hills Fire Company. And he spends a lot of time training and volunteering, and he received life-saving training and was able to apply it. I've told these stories before. Junior programs are phenomenal, great way to build our membership and also a great place for juniors to be on a Friday or a Saturday night and they're learning skills that are going to stay with them the rest of their life, and they do make a difference. And here's a prime example. 16-year-old Mike Brodzinski, a volunteer junior member, sees an umpire collapse as he's playing baseball, does CPR, and saves the umpire's life. Another great story and another great example of juniors doing good Good work. This is probably going to cause some discussion around your club room table in Georgia. Did you read about or hear about the volunteer fire chief that was responding to an auto accident and law, local law enforcement didn't th- like the way he was driving, so they at the scene they ticketed him for reckless driving. And I haven't heard much about this lately. This happened back, I believe, in May. And uh, but it did cause quite a bit of discussion on the social media sites, and uh, we'll see where that one goes if anything else happens. But basically, the police officers didn't like how the chief was driving to the call, I believe with lights and sirens. And when they got there, they said he was driving recklessly and using the emergency lights incorrectly. So. I guess the city wasn't too pleased because the chief was responding to an emergency situation. So hopefully cooler heads prevail and things settle down. That was in the state of Georgia. And here's some good news from our politicians. On June 12th, representatives introduced a Volunteer Responder Incentive Protection Act, which is a bipartisan bill. And what they're looking to do is exempt property tax benefits and up to $600 per year of other incentives being subjected to federal income tax. See, in order to bolster recruitment and retention, many fire and EMS agencies are now providing non-monetary gifts, reduction in property taxes, a reduction in other fees, things like that to try and help recruitment. And they're typically very small, but it's a great way for a community to support their volunteers, which helps build morale and, more importantly, build the membership, right? Well, these are taxed. And uh, this legislation is looking to cap the amount of tax, and it was introduced in the House, and it was also introduced in the Senate, and it's called the Volunteer Responder Incentive Protection Act. And you should contact your local politicians to say, support this bill, support it. It's a great idea. Very small, minimal little gestures that mean so much to the volunteers and show the community supports them and helps them and this would certainly give them a little bit of a tax break, which uh, which everyone can use, right? So I would recommend contacting some of your local politicians and certainly uh, tell them to support such a thing. So, hey, the NFPA announced the fire prevention theme for 2015. Hear the beep where you sleep. Every bedroom needs a working smoke alarm. That'll be the theme this year, Fire Prevention Week, October 4th through 12th this year. Hopefully you're involved. Get out to the schools, educate the public in your area about fire safety steps they can take, fire prevention. Show them the skills that you have. Open the doors of the firehouse. Have them come in, look at the equipment, do a Jaws of Life demonstration. Whatever you can do to connect with your community is certainly encouraged. But the theme for 2015's Fire Prevention Week, which is October 4th through 12th. Where you sleep, every bedroom needs a working smoke detector. And a follow-up to a story from a couple months ago, if you remember a couple months ago, there was a story that some firefighters down in Florida were suing the municipality due to uh, neck injuries they say they received from wearing the Carnes 1044 helmet. This was down in St. Petersburg, And uh, several months ago, this was big news. And a follow-up on that story is the mayor in St. Petersburg is seriously considering replacing the 1044 Carnes helmets. However, 
it causes a budget crunch because they have to purchase 313 helmets and if it needed to if if needed to purchase all of those it would cost the city over $60,000 so it's still going on uh some firefighters suing the municipality saying that the 1044 helmets have caused them neck injuries and one last bit of news that hit the website tonight it's interesting is did you see the firehouse down in Texas the volunteer firehouse actually had their website hacked by supposed jihadists. Volunteer Fire Department down in Web- in um, Pearl in Texas. Their website was hacked by jihadists. They immediately shut it down. It's no foul play or anything on their bad behavior by the Volunteer Fire Department at all. It was a malicious intrusion. And this was just an honest, uh, open website that had really not been maintained in over a year. Supposedly some jihadists got in and hacked it. So, again, maybe a reminder that we just need to try and take steps to make sure we're protecting ourselves from things like that happening. So, lots going on. That's a that's a real nutshell of things going on in the volunteer fire service and the fire service in general. If there's anything on you on your mind that you'd like to talk about tonight, feel free to call in. We're going to be talking about highway safety, and if you have anything to say on that or want to talk about anything else, certainly the number is 760-454-8852, and we would love to hear from you. If uh, if you have anything you would like to add to the conversation, and uh, I would like to introduce our guest. His name is Jack McDonald. He's the director of training for the Emergency Responder Safety Institute, which is a diverse group of seasoned emergency services providers, and they are dedicated to reducing the emergency responder deaths and injuries at highway emergency incidents. Jack has over 25 years' experience in fire and emergency medical services. He has held the position of lieutenant, assistant chief, deputy chief, and safety officer during his long and distinguished career, and he is extremely passionate about teaching highway safety, getting the word out about highway safety and steps we can take to better protect ourselves at these highway incidents. And he is also a principal member of the National Fire Protection of the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And I'm sorry, he's a principal member of the National Fire Protection Association Technical Committee on Traffic Control Incident Management and a master instructor for the Federal Highway National Traffic Incident Management Train the Trainer program. And it's my pleasure, and I'm very honored to have him on the show tonight because he's got a lot of great information to share with us. Jack, are you with us? Hi, Tom. Thanks for inviting me on tonight. And uh, before we go too far, I don't want to slander Mr. McDonald's name. I'm not sure who Jack McDonald is, but uh, my last name is Sullivan. <laughs> Sullivan, yes. And we want to oh make sure God. we get that the right guy that takes the no, flack for whatever goes right. on this evening. <laughs> you know, it's funny as I'm looking at a news clipping in front of me, and it's by Jack McDonald, and I was looking at that. So, major, major apologies, sir. That is. Uh, Let, let's that not is get my him mistake. in trouble for anything stupid. No, nope, and said I tonight. just threw that. I just threw that in the trash because that was embarrassing, and I'm very sorry about that, sir. <laughs> But I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, and I know in talking with you that you are extremely passionate and share the concerns I have about these highway incidents, and and we need to get the word out to our responders about things that can be done. And, And it doesn't have to be on a major highway either. And I used to stand up in my volunteer fire department when I was chief of department and tell my members, very seriously and very honestly, I feared a line of duty death at a highway incident more than any structure fire that I went to. Not to say that every structure fire always goes well, but we go to a lot of highway incidents. There's, I think, so many things that are out of our control at these incidents, and I seriously feared a line of duty death at some of these incidents more than at a fire incident. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, and I'll be the first to admit that it, it was a line of duty death that got me involved in this subject back in 1998, March of 98. I had uh, just retired from the Lionville Fire Company in Lionville, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. The uh, crew that I had worked with for a number of years responded to a routine, if there is such a thing, motor vehicle crash on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And by the time the uh, incident was all done and over with at the end of the day, uh, firefighter Dave Good did not get to go home at the end of the day, did not survive an incident where 
a tractor trailer uh, approaching the scene where our folks were working um, went out of control, flipped over on its side, and wiped through the incident scene, striking 10 of the responders that were there, eight firefighters and two EMTs, um, put all of them in the hospital, and firefighter Dave Good did not survive that incident. And that was one of the events that got me involved in this particular subject, and we've been working on it hard ever since. Mm, and what a tragic story. What an upsetting story. Something that certainly going to stay with you forever, and hopefully out of something so tragic, something good can come from it. And 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 I think, I think, and what I used to tell people is, I think the first thing we need to do is just create the awareness that the, there's no routine traffic accident, no routine highway incident, and uh, there's there's some procedures we need to take and take it every single call to to limit the the possibility of these tragic accidents happening. Was did this start out as a normal routine call? Uh yeah, it was a single car that spun out of control in a rainstorm and ended up well off the operating lanes of the highway in a ditch line. A uh, wide shoulder area in a ditch, and uh, all of the equipment was off the travel lanes of the roadway. And uh, the truck driver, as he approached the scene, um, changed lanes from the right lane to the left lane, and in the process of doing that, his trailer struck the concrete barrier wall that divides the highway from the eastbound and westbound lanes. And uh, he lost control of the tractor-trailer unit at that point. It came across the two lanes of the highway again struck the driver's door of the assistant chief's vehicle, overturned, and had enough momentum left in it that it kind of wiped through the rest of the incident scene where the rest of the responders were standing, uh, striking in total two in the assistant chief's vehicle and eight uh, that were standing at the rear of the ambulance in the process of loading the victim into the ambulance. Oh, man, man. And just just awful. In the blink of an eye, right? In the blink of an eye. Yep. Yep, you really don't have time to react to some of these things, unfortunately. And um, even though we describe that as a routine incident, it, it, what it is is one of those incidents that we all respond to on a regular basis. Um, how many of us go to multiple motor vehicle crashes in, the, in a week's time? We get very confident in our abilities to uh, handle that incident, everything from extrication to patient care, extinguishing any fires, removing any hazards, uh, in some cases, uh, taking care of traffic control in those areas that have fire police officers and whatnot. And um, we're we're so confident in our abilities to take it that sometimes we get just a little bit uh, off of our game and not paying attention to what's going on around us, and uh, it just takes a blink of an eye before things can change dramatically. And we saw that illustrated again this past weekend down in Florida on the Florida Turnpike where the fire department had responded to an incident had just arrived on the scene, uh, set their rig in a blocking fashion, had put out some road cones and a tractor trailer approaching the scene, struck the engine, and just barely missed the ambulance and the uh, firefighters that were standing in the same area before he came to a stop. And uh, I'm sure those guys, when they turned out for that call, weren't expecting that kind of a situation. But I can't tell you how many times we see this story repeated over and over and over again on a weekly basis, and it's not just a volunteer issue. This affects fire and EMS agencies all around the country, whether you're paid or volunteer. It doesn't matter. It, it's uh, it's one of those things that we're all exposed to when you respond to a call and you step out of your emergency vehicle, whatever emergency vehicle it is, you travel to the scene and you're stepping in the harm's way on any kind of roadway surface. Oh, no, that's just so true, Jack. I mean, every day it seems like when you go on the fire service websites or just check the local news, there's near misses and, and every now and then these tragic stories. And and uh, the good news is, I guess, is I think we have more awareness of it. Um, the bad news is the incidents just continue. But um, but there's also success stories about things being done correctly, which even though a driver still does something crazy or goes out of control that because the first responders had some training and took the appropriate steps, everybody walked away. They may need a new rig, but at least they're walking away. What do you think, compared to that tragic incident from 20 years ago, what do you think are some of the main steps that have been taken to hopefully re What wasn't being done then that's definitely being done now in your eyes? Uh, I would tell you in 1998, nobody was really talking about roadway incident safety. Um, when we started to research the subject after the incident, 
we found three fire departments in the country that had developed some sort of a standard operating guideline or procedure for the department to follow on highway incidents. Uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, Plano, Texas, and Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, those three departments had documents in place and training for their personnel on highway incidents. We were fortunate enough to get copies of all of those SOPs at the time, and uh, frankly, it was pretty obvious when you look at all three of them at the same time that they all came from the same source, but we could never identify which of those departments was the first out of the gate with that material. And um, that was the start of it at that point, and we have been talking about the awareness piece of it ever since, and of course that has evolved into a whole lot of training and strategies and tactics and uh, changes in our apparatus in terms of high visibility markings and emergency lighting and uh, a variety of other things. So the awareness piece, I think, has uh, come a long way since 1998. I think the training, we now have resources available for all the fire departments on appropriate roadway incident safety training. Um, it's available in most cases for free in a variety of different ways, and there's plenty of people out there teaching the subject. I think that's an improvement. Of course, a few years ago, there was a lot of uh, um, heartburn that was going around because of the uh, increased use of high-visibility vests and garments, and some of the rules that had been written didn't seem to coordinate or synchronize with each other. I think we've finally gotten that squared away. Um, yes, we want you to wear high-visibility gear when you're out exposed to moving traffic. No, we don't want you to wear high-visibility vests when you're fighting a vehicle fire or something like that. I think we finally got that smoothed out. Um, oh, so right uh, there, that's up the, so you're saying that uh, you pulling up on a motor vehicle fire, don't don't spend a couple minutes fighting with that high visibility vest, getting it on your gear. No, and the rules have been written in such that if you're exposed to fire, heat, flame, or hazardous materials, uh, your NFPA compliant fire gear is appropriate for those types of incidents. Once the fire's out and you're cleaning up, packing hose back on the truck or whatever, you want to take your gear off and put a high-vis vest on, that's fine. Um, and that's what we uh, teach in our classes is to, you know, it's a common sense type of thing, but I have this saying about common sense, and that is wouldn't it be great if it really was? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we have to, sometimes we have to set the bar, I guess, when it comes to the common sense piece. And some of the folks that wrote the rules originally about the use of the high-visibility vest are not, were not, used to doing the job of a firefighter and didn't understand uh, some of the issues that just arbitrarily saying that you have to wear a vest when you're on the street um, didn't make sense to us at the time. So I think we finally got that squared away, and we continue to look for ways to make the scene safer. But I'll be the first one to tell you, Tom, that the biggest problem that we've got out there these days are the distracted drivers that we did not have to deal with. Um, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, for the most part, we're dealing with a different kind of driver today, who's doing yeah, everything but looking changed. out the windshield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that, a much, and much I even more go dangerous back, situation. I, I even go back to what you said originally, just about uh, um, the way we we weren't aware back in the 90s, or maybe we were aware, but we didn't think there was much we could do about it. I, I cannot believe there were only three SOPs. In the late 1990s, as you looked for highway safety SOPs, and I'm not surprised where you found them at all, three very progressive departments, but uh, wow, I guess we really, it, it, it reminded me, I, we have a very busy highway going through our fire district. Uh, we actually have part of the New York State Thruway, and um, I, I remember when I was a young firefighter at an auto accident, we have one area, probably like many fire departments, where we're up there regularly, and uh, because it's poorly laid out and it's handling much more traffic than it was ever designed for. And I remember once when we were up there on a Friday afternoon rush hour and we handled the one accident, and as we were handling that accident, accidents were happening seemingly left and right of us all over. And I'll never forget looking over at a big New York State trooper who, you know, they stand there with their Stetsons on and no vest, of course, at the time, but he had flares out and he was trying to direct traffic. He finally, I'll never forget, a big New York State trooper with his, with his Stetson on threw his flares up in the air and had a look of disgust on him, shrugged his shoulders, looked at us, and walked away because there was nothing he could do. Cars, it was like bumper cars up there. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and uh, so I'd like to think we've definitely progressed quite far from there. Well, I think anybody that's spent any time on the street can relate to uh, close calls and woulda, shoulda, 
Dakota type incidents where we walked away and maybe um, on a different day at a different time it might have had a different outcome. And uh, I think one of the problems that we're fighting is that when we look at the number of line of duty deaths each year from being struck by a vehicle, that number is not real large compared to the number that you cited not too long ago on cardiac and heart-related fatalities. And um, what we have to keep reminding people is that it's not just the line of duty deaths that we're concerned about. It's the close calls. It's the injuries. It's the incident like we talked about a little while ago on, on Saturday of this weekend down in Florida. Uh, fortunately, everybody walked away. There were no injuries reported, no line of duty death, but an engine got struck was damaged, will be out of service for a period of time, whether it can be rebuilt, repaired, or whatever remains to be seen, I guess. But uh, those incidents tend to get lost in the shuffle over time. They don't show up in the statistics at the end of the year, and it's those types of incidents that happen with more frequency. And the only reason that we're not talking about it at the end of the year is because it didn't result in a line of duty death, but every single one of them could have or could have been Absolutely. multiple line of duty deaths. And uh, so we got to look at the big picture, and sometimes that's tough to do when we're just looking at some of the statistics that go out each year. I don't think it tells the whole story. No, for sure, for sure. And I'd just like to remind everybody that they're uh, listening to Fire Engineering Talk Radio. This is the Professional Volunteer Fire Department series, and I am Tom Merrill, and along with me this evening is Jack Sullivan, so embarrassed that newspaper clipping is actually torn up now. <laughs> My daughter came in and I pointed at it and told her take this out of here and tear it up. It's can't I guess I'm not a multitasker, Jack. So I apologize for that. But I'm so pleased to have Jack Sullivan on with us tonight, and he talks about strategies and tactics for roadway incidents. And again, as responders, we should be aware of the dangers and we should be honest with ourselves that you know what we love going to fires and helping people out, but we really need to be careful also at these highway incidents, and there's no simple highway incident. So, Jack, let me ask you, as a first responder, what are some of the important steps we should be taking or thinking about as we're rolling up on these accidents? One of the things that we talk about in our training is doing a size-up for a roadway incident. And my experience to date has been we do a pretty good job for new company officers uh, in various training classes, teaching them how to do a size-up of a structure fire that they're responding to, how to look at multiple sides of the building, report the, the type of construction, number of stories, what's kind of visible at the time and whatnot. But we don't always do as good a job on our size-up at roadway incidents. So that first arriving emergency vehicle and the first arriving officer needs to to give a real good size up of the incident that they're looking at and describe for the others that are still responding to the incident not only what you see as you arrive on the scene but also to start to think in your mind what the best position of incoming apparatus and emergency vehicles is going to be so that we don't have uh, what one of my friends refers to as the Walmart parking approach where you kind of cruise around the parking lot and look for the closest place to park your vehicle uh, there really needs to be a little bit of organization to where we spot the emergency vehicles as they arrive on the scene. So that first-in officer, um, first and foremost, has to give a good first-in size-up report that reports that we've got two or three vehicles involved, that they're in the left shoulder and left lane of whatever highway it is that you're at, confirm the actual location where you find the incident, because as we all know that Many times the location that we're dispatched to respond to is not where we find the actual incident. Uh, sometimes we're told to respond to the eastbound lanes of the highway and we actually find the incident in the westbound lanes. And very often whatever mile marker is given to us as a start, um, that's not where the incident is. That's where the caller happened to be when they were talking to the 911 dispatcher and uh, they did the best they could to tell them where they were, but the incident itself might have been two miles behind them. I'm sure most of your listeners have had a similar experience to that. If it's a two-lane country road, are there lanes open? Can you safely work the scene and leave any lanes open? Do you block the entire road? Uh, and if you're going to block the road, what kind of resources do you need? And are they en route? And if not, are you requesting them? And uh, make sure that everybody's got a good idea of what's going on. And, and then tell the incoming units that you know they're coming with you where you want them to position when they arrive on the scene. There might be another engine coming with you that uh, you may want to use as a blocking vehicle. Tell them where to park and how to park. 
uh, an ambulance that might be en route for uh, injured workers, make sure that uh, they know where they're supposed to spot, preferably downstream of the incident in a protected area. Uh, for those of your listeners that have fire police officers in the area and you need to shut roads down or whatever, be specific and give them specific instructions of uh, what you want to do with traffic in terms of a detour or whatever that might be available. And just set the scene because what you do in the first five minutes of an incident is going to pretty much set the scene for the way the rest of that incident is going to go for the duration until you get finished. So the uh, the first thing is do a good size up. Make sure oh, that absolutely. you set make sure that you set a safety block in place. And very often that job falls to the biggest uh, piece of fire apparatus that's on the scene. Uh, make sure that your driver operators know how to park a vehicle in a blocking position at an angle with the front wheels turned away from the incident. Um, block the lane and sometimes the lane plus one of where the incident is. And then once you've got that established, you need to start thinking about what's happening to the traffic behind you in addition to whatever other duties you have to do when you arrive on the scene, patient care, hazard control, or whatever the situation might require and uh, assign responsibility for setting out uh, advance warning or setting up a block on the other side of the incident if necessary on a two-lane road, for example. Um, if you do have a lane blocked on a two-lane road and you set up a block with your fire engine, uh, who's going to take care of manual traffic control? Are you just going to let folks decide how they're going to navigate past the incident scene in the open lane? That could lead to a secondary crash and more problems. Um, and then uh, Too much make to sure think that about, you've got... Jack. <laughs> It is. It, it's a lot to think about. And, um, you know, it's like anything else in our business, Tom. You, these thoughts only take a few seconds going through your mind, and you've got to make some good decisions very quickly, just like we do with a structure fire or anything else. And um, you get better at it as time goes on. Um, yeah, yeah, you know. lighting? It, I was just going to say, you know, again, you you, taught, you raised a good point there earlier just about how we do spend a lot of time with our officers trying to educate them about the fire and giving good updates and good size-ups at the fire. This is a whole other thing to look at out uh, for training purposes and, and to educate our officers. And, and, again, maybe we're making them aware, but now let's work with them on proper size-up and, uh, and looking at all these points you just raised. And we're just getting there. These are things that are happening, yeah. as you said, the first five minutes set the tone for the operation. The first five minutes may be what saves the life, our life. And if we don't take these steps and we don't think about these things, then uh, we, it could be a, in for a world of hurt. And another thing, Jack, that I thought about is, you know, it's important here, and I can say this because this is my paid job, is a dispatch center buy-in. In other words, we can't have dispatchers sometimes wondering why they're being asked to repeat certain things over the radio. If a chief's giving a good size up or an officer or first responder's giving a size up that he wants other incoming units to hear, to be aware of, we need to educate, I think, our dispatch centers as well that, hey, even dispatching is different. They're more of the team. They need to be repeating this information. They need to be aware that this information is important because I guarantee you there are dispatchers out there that will look up in the sky and say, why is he telling me this? I don't care. And I think we need to get their buy-in. And we encourage uh, dispatchers and call takers to be involved with uh, training on this particular subject. Um, one of the things that we've done over the years is kind of transition from just teaching roadway incident safety in the firehouse to now moving toward multi-agency type classroom uh, instructor-like classes where we have firefighters and EMT paramedics and law enforcement officers, Department of Transportation personnel, call takers and 911 dispatchers, towing and recovery personnel, all of the folks that you work with on a routine basis at these motor vehicle incidents, whether it's a vehicle fire or a crash or even just a brush fire on the side of the road, they all have a role to play, and what we found is that we get much better results when everybody hears the same message in a training program. Uh, it mm -hmm. also helps Absolutely. to build up that uh, dialogue, communication, coordination, and collaboration between agencies. The best time to uh, talk about what you're going to do when you get a roadway incident is around a kitchen table and a cup of coffee and not at 2 o'clock in the morning on a rainy night trying to... Uh, argue with a law enforcement officer about where your truck is parked and what you're going to do next. Um, and and that's, the, the more... <laughs> that's the nasty uh, 
the thing nobody wants to talk about, and uh, unfortunately it does rear its ugly head in, in different areas of the country, and that's interagency cooperation. And, and I think uh, I'll, I'll call it that C word again, communication. If we can communicate ahead of time, if we can sit down, and again, it's the C word, over that cup of coffee and handle and hash things out, it certainly pays huge dividends down the road and not at 2 in the morning when you're arguing over opening or closing a road. Got to get everyone on the same page. Got to have interagency cooperation. Probably easier said than done. Uh, Yeah, but we know it can be done because we've seen it work in certain areas. And Somebody's got to put the effort together, bring folks together ahead of time to talk about the uh, situation. We found that uh, tabletop exercises are a great way to talk about incidents that have already occurred, what worked well, what didn't work so well. Um, Everybody probably has an area in their first-run district where they've been multiple times for motor vehicle crashes. I know in each department that I was in, we always had a a place that you could be pretty sure you were going to respond to another another motor vehicle crash there sometime. Um, Set it up in a tabletop exercise and talk about what you're going to do the next time you have one of those incidents. And uh, that gets the conversation going. And it's not unusual to have a police officer tell a firefighter, well, I wouldn't do that because of this. And then a firefighter to explain to the police officer why he did it and how it affects their operation. That communication and collaboration goes a long way. It's it's not that we don't all do things the same way, but if we communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it and we can help others understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and we understand what they're doing and why, then everybody starts to get the bigger picture, and things tend to be more efficient and more effective when we get to the scene. Absolutely. Invite everybody in to talk about it ahead of time. And, and another one, even, I, I, I think you'd agree with me, it's the tow agencies. We need to get them on the same page, too. I've, I've seen very well-set-up scenes, well-protected scenes, and wreckers come in and just totally have no regard for how we're doing things. And, and and most of them do an absolutely fantastic job. Most of them are wearing the vest. Most of them are know the dangers. They have a very dangerous job. But we should invite them in, too. Invite all the different entities together ahead of time. Talk about it. As you said, many of these... Uh, many of our districts, many of our response areas have these roadways that we're familiar with that we'll respond to regularly. Start there. Start planning there. And again, folks, I'd like to remind you, you're listening to Fire Engineering Talk Radio. And my very special guest, Mr. Jack Sullivan, as we talk about strategies and tactics for mitigating these highway emergency incidents and handling them in a safe, safe, and safe environment as possible. If you'd like to call in, feel free. That number that uh, you can call in at seven six zero four five four eight eight five two. And Jack, I do have a a caller on the line. If you don't mind, we'll we'll stop our thought process here and and see who our caller is. It's actually from my area code of seven one six. So let's see who we have here and welcome them aboard. If you don't mind. Hello, you're on Fire Engineering Talk Radio. This is Tom Merrill. Who we have here? Evening, Chief. It's uh, Mike Bastido from uh, your department. Hello, Mike Basito. Mike Basito is one of our newer members, been in a couple of years now, very energetic, great responder, and uh, follows what's going on in the fire service, very passionate about the fire service, and him and I have had many, many great conversations. What gives you, what uh, making you call in tonight? Well, I've been uh, listening to, obviously, your <clears throat> your discussion for a while, and, um, you know, this one just was interesting to me. Um, you know, I started... Uh, I guess about 15 years ago in, in EMS before I actually joined the fire service proper. And um, <clears throat> a couple of my earlier experiences were less around, you know, how to operate on a, a highway incident than how you respond to them. Um, I worked in a, an EMS provider role before, and a couple of things I kind of brought with me when I came to the, the department here um, now was my experience there was, you know, how you how you respond to the scene is as much as important as how you operate at the scene. <clears throat> and I think at the point I had been in about a year and a half and, you know, being admittedly pretty green at that point, hadn't really been around the, the big red trucks yet and gotten a real appreciation of, uh, you know, the magnitude of what we're doing and what that, <clears throat> how the public responds to seeing the lights and sirens and, and everything else going on around them and, and how it kind of creates that reaction. Um, I had a couple of scary moments myself where, um, you know, I kind of feared for my own life, and I realized after the fact that I wasn't really operating with as much of a cool head as I should, and I've, I've 
try to bring that now as much as I can, to, you know, to both myself being new in, in the fire service, doing both EMS and fire, but also the you know the other younger members who, um, you know, I'm coming in in my mid 30s, and we've got some some younger members who are coming in, you know, luckily earlier on in their careers and in their late teens, early 20s, but don't have as much of the experience on the road, and you know, to make them aware of a lot of things you've said that. You know, people, you know, the flashing lights and sirens, people are like a deer in headlights, quite literally, that, you know, they, they don't yeah. understand how to do it. So you've yeah. got to really keep your eyes and ears open. You've got to be aware of what you're doing. And <clears throat> in a, a chief officer's role, you know, we have to look to them to say they're looking at it from a 10,000-foot point of view. And I know uh, both you and our current chief have said, you know, they, they often view operating at a highway incident or MBA is, is often more challenging than a fire ground because nothing is moving on a fire ground outside of the fire and ourselves. Um, you know, we're on a highway, you've got vehicles moving at, at very high rates of speed, not paying attention to what's going on. Um, and we, you know, may not hear them coming, may not see them where, you know, a fire is bright and hot and you have a little more awareness of, of what that is. Right, um, and that's a whole nother whole nother training area there, right, uh, right, Jack. And that's uh, certainly uh, driving is uh, a subject that uh, we could probably spend an entire episode on as well, and and uh, mm-hmm. teaching our responders the the uh, the awareness that you know people are going to slam their brakes on. People are just uh, we talked earlier about how distracted they are, much more so today than. 20 years ago where maybe they just turned a radio dial. Now they're doing many other things than that, and they're so distracted and not hearing and not seeing what's going on around them. So another training issue involving response is training our drivers how to drive appropriately. Absolutely. And uh, that's something that needs to be put in uh, probably along with our other training programs on highway safety. Maybe you start even with... Uh, you know, that's a whole nother training evolution, and that's driver training. And it's actually going to be the subject of one of my upcoming shows, the September show. We're going to have a, a very uh, prominent uh, instructor, Mike Wilberon, talking about driving fire apparatus and emergency vehicles and what we can do to implement some good programs in, in our in our system. Um, Mike, let me ask you now. I know you were involved in EMS 15 years ago, and you, and you got in the fire service a year and a half ago with us. Coming into the fire service, were you surprised at what you've been witnessing on these highways when you're standing around performing EMS or fire suppression on the vehicles? Do you think you were made aware by the, was it properly introduced to you by the officers or did it catch you by surprise that, oh my gosh, this is dangerous? No, I mean, I think I I came in in my mid-30s, so I... I kind of knew how dangerous the public was on the road, but I think we have, when I started originally EMS, we didn't have as much of a robust um, driver training program or even just, you know, general training program um, as we do here in, in my current department. So I think we got, I got a lot of that benefit. Um, I think things have evolved, obviously, in the last 15 years quite a bit. <clears throat> but, um, you know, the one thing I think, being a little bit older, you have more of that... Um, life experience knowledge of things that you don't early on that just kind of comes with in general experience. But the, um, some of my earlier things, you know, I, I kind of learned you, you don't, people don't know how to react with that. Um, and you kind of learn that a bit and how big of an apparatus you're driving has an impact both on how dangerous you are and as well as how much people move or don't move or, <clears throat> or what their response is to it. Um, but I think also we've done a very good job of just with being visible when you respond to the scene, making sure you get off not on the traffic side of the vehicle. If you're on the right shoulder, you get off on the shoulder side. You don't get off on the traffic side. Making sure we're wearing safety vests, making sure you're always wearing your helmet, um, which, you know, doesn't have a huge benefit potentially if you're hit at a high rate of speed. But, um you know, make sure you're protecting yourself as much as possible. Um, and I think our officers do a very good job of, Awareness of that as well, just, you know, people in the truck, if you got new one getting off, you grab them before they jump out the traffic side of the truck. Yep, you let know, me, you know what, it reminds me of, sure. right, right there, you just reminded me of something that I had put out of my memory somehow, and, and Jack, you'll appreciate this. Um, I remember being on a highway incident as a young officer and walking around um, a 
I was already on scene. I had come on a previous vehicle, and one of our apparatus was pulling up to the scene. It was a pumper truck, and it was a pumper engine, and the pumper pulled up, and a young firefighter, without even thinking, got out of the vehicle without looking and stepped immediately into a high-speed lane. And when I talked to him, of course, we immediately pulled him aside and talked to him about staying off to the side. And when I talked to him about why he did it, he just assumed that people naturally moved over a lane and naturally got out of the way because of the fire apparatus. He wasn't aware of what he had just done. And God forbid, if a car had been coming, he would have been hit immediately. So, again, that highlighted to me the importance of this awareness training and the importance of getting and talking to our people before they even respond. Jack, we don't want we don't want our responders first call to be on a major highway, do we? And no, if definitely it is, not. It's got to be I, taken care of. <laughs> but I think you've just touched on a subject that's a, a, a problem area for us, Tom, and that is that there are an awful lot of volunteer departments, especially that send new recruits to a firefighter one and maybe an EMTB class and hazmat awareness and they come back with their certificates, and then they're allowed to respond to emergency calls. But at that point, in EMTB and most Firefighter 1 classes, they have not gotten any awareness training of roadway incident safety. Um, In almost Mm -hmm. all cases, that falls on the local department to take that responsibility. And I can't emphasize enough, especially for the volunteer departments, before you let any new people respond direct to an emergency, either in their own vehicle or on an emergency vehicle, you have got to prepare them for the kind of chaos that they're going to find when they arrive on the scene and make sure that they're aware of the hazard from traffic in the area. They're not getting that training in Firefighter 1 or EMTB class, and um, it's one of the areas that we need to make sure that the departments take the responsibility for orientation training. And then I always recommend this subject should be on the annual rotation of training topics at least once a year, The department should be reviewing their standard operating procedures and guidelines for roadway incidents and making sure that they review with all of the members um, those safety practices that they've put in place for roadway incidents, how to park the vehicle, what to wear in the way of PPE, how to set up advanced warning, how to set up temporary traffic control, um, et cetera, et cetera, that's just not being covered in the other training classes yet. No, not at all. Not aware. Not at all. Awareness is huge. It's huge. Mike, is there anything else you'd like to share with us or talk to uh, to Jack about? I mean, the other thing I thought of actually was a recent uh, <clears throat> call we had this weekend that was kind of around the, you know, where are you in the responsible, where where are you responding when you get there? How do you let dispatch know where you're at and where you need resources? Um, we kind of fell in a, <clears throat> a call this weekend where we had a, a bit of a gray area between one highway and the other where, you know, luckily, no one was in a immediate danger zone, but I think that's a definite issue of, um, you know, we talk about highway exits and mile markers and what jurisdiction are you in, but how do we indicate <clears throat> both in terms of where we're responding to, but if we need additional resource, what's the right jurisdiction for it? I think that's that's a challenge. I mean, we're a bit cursed and blessed in our district where we have a good mix of, of residential as well as highway, and we've got a lot of jurisdictions that cover us, but um, when you get around those lines in terms of, who are you getting for help? How do we tell our dispatchers, um, you know, exactly where we are so they know who to send? And when they call someone, that that agency knows they can respond or have authority to respond. I think that's that's another challenge. Um, you know, some of the, the straight line highways in, in different areas, it's, it's a little different. If you're in a urban <clears throat> area, it's pretty pretty straightforward what agency you're going to get. But if you're in a cross between, uh, you know, we are in an, an urban area with a, a state through Ferris Strait Highway coming through, it's it's a bit of a challenge, and we have to be aware of of where we are in those areas and borders. And that takes a little bit of familiarization. Um, not that it's working against yep, us, but I think that's. I guess that gets down to, to be train, aware of. train and train, train, train and train, yep. and and Jack, I think you'd agree with that. Uh, absolutely, and I'd I'd yep. like to take a minute just to highlight some of the training materials that are out there that your listeners might not be familiar with. Um, We've consolidated everything that we know about this particular subject into a website called respondersafety.com. And uh, in the last few years, we have taken the extra step of developing an online learning network 
where we've taken a lot of the material that we teach in instructor-led classes, broken it into modules, and made those modules available for free on the learning network associated with the respondersafety.com website. So um, I think we have 15 active modules at this point. It's uh, important for your listeners to know that it's free. It's been paid for with FEMA and U.S. Fire Administration grant money, amongst other things. So there's no cost to the departments or the individual to use the classes. Most of the modules run about 20 minutes. It's tested. Uh, there's a quiz in the middle of the uh, program and one at the end. If you successfully pass the test, you're issued a certificate at the end of the program, which you then can provide to your chief officers or training officer in your department. Um, we keep adding to those modules all the time, and we also encourage people to take advantage of the uh, traffic incident management training that's going on around the country, um, a national program that was put together by the Federal Highway Administration uh, using a lot of emergency responders to develop the material. And then there's a group of us that uh, have been teaching train-the-trainer classes around the country, those people who attend the train-the-trainer classes. And um, I guess at this point we've got somewhere north of uh, 6,500 people who have been trained in the train-the-trainer classes in every state in the country. Um, they have the ability then to turn around and teach a four-hour version of the Traffic Incident Management and Responder Safety Program that covers a lot of the points that we've talked about this evening. In most cases, that training is free. It's very often coordinated by the Department of Transportation in various states. Sometimes the state p police take the lead in getting that training out around the, the uh, state. Uh, in other cases, the uh, fire academies have taken responsibility for it. So each state is just a little bit different in the way they're approaching it. But there's uh, plenty of training material available on this subject now that back in 1998 didn't really exist. And there's really no excuse for a department not to uh, have the ability to address this subject in some way, shape, or form, even if they don't have the material in front of them right now. It's very easy to get a hold of. It's free. And it's, uh, it's something that any training officer or safety officer can use to do the training in, in their individual departments. There you have it, people. Training officers out there, fire chiefs, officers, leaders, looking for training and drill ideas. I, I, I cannot believe that there are still people out there that say they don't have, have drill ideas for the upcoming season, the drill season coming up, or next week's drill, or how's this for an idea? Let me throw this one out there, people. We all have members that are very busy. We all have members that maybe are struggling to meet minimum training requirements. Maybe their spouse is working a second job. Maybe they have, they're have they working two jobs themselves, but they're still a valuable member. And let's face it, retention is key today in our volunteer fire service. We certainly want to keep our people, and we want them to train, though. This is something they can do at home on their home computer. How about thinking of training credit or extra credit by encouraging them to do things like this. If they can't make that Wednesday night or Thursday night drill or they're low on points toward the end of the year, how about putting them through those 15 modules for some sort of credit? Just an idea, just a crazy idea. I like to throw it out there, but it's an example of how you can get creative in our volunteer fire service and work together to keep our members but also make them better trained members as well. Just had to editorialize a little bit on that, if you don't mind. And, Mike, do you have anything else for Jack before uh, we move on? No, thank you, John. I both appreciate it, and, uh, you know, I appreciate your time tonight. And, um, you know, oh, excellent. Stay safe. No, thank you, brother, and stay safe uh, to you as well, and we'll be seeing you on the fire ground, and thanks for calling in. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Well, some good points there about the new member's perspective on, and uh, certainly opening up the importance of awareness, as you said. And um, so, Jack, we, we've got the awareness training. Maybe we put our people through some of these modules or all these modules. We make them aware. We introduce them to the highway. We're now doing our size up when we get to these calls. We haven't even started getting out of the rig yet. <laughs> what next? What <laughs> should we be thinking way. about? Well, obviously blocking with the apparatus, and uh, that's a little bit more, it's a lot more common, I would say, these days than it was uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, I, I think a direct result of that that we're seeing is there's probably more instances 
of distracted drivers actually running into fire apparatus that's parked and used, used as a block at an incident scene. Um, we got to position the fire apparatus that way to protect our personnel and the victims that were responding to help in the first place. But at the same time, um, we've got to be thinking about the big picture, which is we're using a $500,000 plus fire truck as a barrier wall out there on the highway, and people are running into them. We've got to find a better way to uh, notify motorists that there's an incident up ahead to slow down, move over, um, and not run into our apparatus. And that's a challenge right now. Uh, we've done everything we can possibly think of with high visibility markings and chevrons on the back. We've got all kinds of warning lights. Uh, we hear a lot of people complaining about the brightness of the new LED lights that are out there. The vendors will tell you that their um, customers, the fire, EMS, law enforcement community, when they go to buy a piece of uh, apparatus or emergency vehicle, they're asking for bigger, brighter, faster emergency warning lights. Um, we're not convinced that that necessarily equals safer. And in some cases, we know that the uh, emergency warning lights are contributing to uh, the glare problem at the, some of the incident scenes where people can't see personnel moving on the ground because of the intensity of the warning lights that are out there. Um, we have some departments that continue to leave high beam headlights and or wigwag headlights on at incident scenes that affects the visibility of the drivers approaching from the other direction. So when we Jack, park let me ask in, you a uh, question. Let me, can I ahead. ask you a question? I, I, yeah. I got to do it while it's on my mind. Help, help, help solve this debate or tell me your opinion and I know you're going to be on my side more lighting isn't always better correct I agree yes because I still hear the argument I'm a fire truck or I'm a fire vehicle or emergency response vehicle the more lights the better isn't it a proven fact that sometimes less lighting is better maybe not as distracting because you're continuing to see and, and, you know, we all drive at night, and I see it all the time all over the United States. I see good examples of lighting, and then I see some examples where I am totally distracted and cannot see a thing. Um, I think the problem there is the one key word you just used, which is proven. And the answer is there are very few studies available that have looked at this particular issue specifically to help us decide what type and display of emergency lighting is safest at an incident scene. Um, we have done uh, some studies through federal agencies to help look at some aspects of emergency lighting at an incident scene. Some of the results of those studies are available uh, for anybody free on respondersafety.com, so you can look at it yourself. But the problem nowadays is that uh, nobody has taken a hard look at the type of emergency lighting technology that's available to us today and what the safest way is to set it up and use it at an incident scene. All of the manufacturers that we've talked to have the ability to provide a high power, low power, or night and day switch on their emergency lighting package so that the LED lighting package that you use in the daytime can be dimmed down a little bit. It's still very visible at nighttime, but it's not as intense at nighttime. But uh, the, the problem that we're having, Tom, is that we just don't have the ability to get the research and studies done that would help prove, as is the word that you use, uh, which way is the best. And that's part of the issue that we're fighting at the moment. Um, we think that there's a, a minimum amount of uh, warning lights that should be used at the scene, and FPA provides some gu guidance on that in their 1901 standard for motorized fire apparatus. Most new apparatus these days, you know, when you put it in park at an incident scene, it automatically turns off some of the warning lights on the vehicle. For example, in most cases, it will maybe turn off the high beam headlights, maybe turn off the wigwag headlights, turn off forward-facing white emergency lights, um, maybe bring up some of the amber lighting that might be on the rig and reduce some of the lighting in some areas. The standard provides some guidance on that. And uh, one of the things that we have to remember is older apparatus might not have the automated computer systems on board, which means the driver operator has to turn off certain lights in order to have the same effect. So, uh, I'm, so we I'm definitely kind of want to be it. turning off those high beams, right? Yeah, I think. And, I, and I, I truly think we could do a better job of managing emergency lighting at the scene. The uh, Emergency Responder Safety Institute just did a training module on emergency lighting that's available on the uh, learning network 
for free that specifically addresses wow. that particular issue as best we can, um, letting people know what the technology and um, the research is that's out there and what our recommendations are. And when we filmed it, we actually did a drive-through of incident scenes with different emergency lighting setups to show the difference uh, with different types of emergency lighting in place and in use and dimmed down or turned off in some in some situations. So it's up to the uh, the individual to make up their mind right now until we get some funding to do some research and studies that will help prove one way or the other what the best way is to do things. Lots well, to be thinking about. Luckily, there is some good information out there that's free, as you mentioned. And I, I got to ask you, what this will often cross my mind as a first responder and a, a, as a chief officer. Oftentimes, I would get to an accident first in my chief's SUV. Now, I was fortunate; I had a lighting package on it. It was well marked. But again, I'm pulling up to an auto accident on a high-speed highway, New York State Thruway, or something like that and I have a vehicle accident, it's center lane, right lane, left lane, doesn't matter. What are some of the steps I can take to protect myself in that environment? I'm the first one there, and I'm confronted with an accident, be it small or large, but I've got traffic whizzing by still at 70 miles an hour. Yeah, and I guess your job might be to uh, provide some warning for that traffic that there's a problem up ahead in some cases. And um, I... uh, had the experience of working up in Michigan a couple of years ago with a number of departments on some training. And uh, one of the fire departments in Michigan, the Livonia Fire Department, uh, has equipped their battalion chief's vehicle with a kind of a unique uh, warning light bar on it that has a pop-up arrow board as part of it. So their chief officer, when they arrive at the scene in the battalion chief's vehicle, can flip up and activate the arrow board that's built into the warning light bar from the the driver's seat and activate the arrow to point traffic in the direction you want them to go before they come to a stop. And um, that's uh, if you're the first vehicle on the scene and you really can't render care or do whatever needs to be done and you're going to be directing the apparatus coming in, sometimes just the presence of your emergency vehicle with the warning lights will start to get some people's attention. It certainly won't get all of them. And the idea is to at least get traffic to slow down and move away from the incident Uh, If you're in the right lane, right shoulder, to get them to move toward the left. Uh, And if you're in the left lane or left shoulder, to get them to move to the right and to use your warning light package to do that as best you can until bigger apparatus gets there to provide a block. And communicate. I think this is where that communicate word comes in again. To your dispatch, to other incoming units, here's what I need you to do. You got to start moving traffic to this direction, stay back, get law enforcement to help block lanes, whatever it needs to be, but let's communicate what's going to be needed. I know that's one of the steps I could take. And and, and the other one that I think is not used enough, and, and tell me if you know uh, that this is a good idea. You mentioned it earlier, and I, I'd like to re-mention it because I think it's important. I think the simple action of turning the vehicle's tires, the blocking vehicle, even if it's just a smaller chief SUV or even a car, if that's all it is at the time, turning those wheels can hopefully at least limit the chance of a car or vehicle launching forward into the scene. We hope so. And uh, some of the incidents that have occurred over the last few years have seemed to uh, validate that. But the idea is that, and it's, it's, I'm sorry to say it, and it's a sad situation, but we have to assume when we park our emergency vehicle at a roadway incident um, that that vehicle is going to get hit somewhere along the way. And we've got to think about where that emergency vehicle is going to go after it's hit. And what we don't want to do is have it pushed directly into the work area where our personnel are working. So the idea of parking the apparatus on an angle uh, is kind of two reasons. One is that it's easier for approaching motorists to identify the fact that your vehicle is stopped, parked, and not moving when it's parked at an angle than when it's parked in line with traffic. If all they can see are the taillights and the warning lights on the rear of your vehicle and they're closing at a high rate of speed, they cannot always determine in a timely fashion that your vehicle is not moving. To them, it may appear that your vehicle is still moving even though you're parked. If you park your vehicle, chief's vehicle, engine, ambulance, whatever the case may be, on an angle, it's easier for approaching traffic to understand, for those people that are paying attention anyway, 
that your apparatus or, or emergency vehicle is stopped, parked, and not moving. And the second reason we do that is that if it does get hit, it will hopefully not be pushed into the work area where your personnel are actually operating. That will be pushed away from that area. And uh, you've got to think about where's your vehicle going to go when it's hit. Where is it going to aim? Where is it going to uh, end up after it's been hit someplace? And we want to try to avoid um, the work area where our personnel are, and we want to try and aim it in the direction that's going to cause the least amount of uh, trouble if it does get hit at the incident scene. Wow, that's great Great information right there. Park at an angle. If you park straight and all they see are the, the rear lights, they may not know that you're not moving. Good information. Good, good, solid information. And you also mentioned earlier, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, I agree, we're, we're sometimes using $500,000 vehicles as a throwaway blocking device. Have you heard or seen of any other ideas that are coming down the pipe that that may take the place of a, a very expensive fire apparatus? I know some areas of the country send ladder trucks, and, heck, that's a million-dollar vehicle. Yes, and uh, some departments use uh, tractor-drawn aerials, and uh, the folks in the city of Philadelphia will tell you the story about one of their tractor-drawn aerials just being struck within the last 30 days or so at a roadway incident where a uh, truck coming into the area hit the trailer. I don't know the amount of damage that was done, but that's another tractor-drawn aerial that would be out of service for a period of time while they try to evaluate and repair. Um, I think one of the the neat ideas that we've seen, again, comes from the state of Michigan. My friends up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, almost three years ago now, put together, uh, I'll I'll take that back, it's almost four years ago at this point, put together um, a utility truck. They refer to it as Utility 2. They actually went to the Department of Utilities in the city and took a dump truck that was in the um, salvage yard. They were getting ready to send it to auction, as I understood it. Uh, They bought it for a dollar to make the transfer legal. They put it in the fire um, machine shop and uh, repaired it, put it back so it was roadworthy, painted it, added warning devices, and a uh, big-ass arrow board, as I like to call it, on the back end of the truck, And then the Michigan Department of Transportation provided them with an attenuator trailer to pull behind that truck. Now, the reason that Grand Rapids Fire did this was because in the space of about 30 days several years ago, they had two of their engines struck um, on the interstate that runs through the middle of their city at two different incidents and took both of those trucks out of service for a period of time. And they started to look for ways that they uh, would not lose one of their emergency vehicles And Utility 2 now rolls out for any incident on the highway at this point. Um, It's my understanding that they split their crews so that one person brings Utility 2. They set it up with the arrow board and the attenuator trailer. And uh, then that person goes back to the engine crew that they're normally with to perform whatever services have to be performed. And so far in the last three or four years, this has been a very successful experiment for them. They're basically taking a truck that's uh, worth much less than a piece of fire apparatus and putting it out with a a very large DOT-type arrow board on the back of it and this attenuator trailer, that's what approaching traffic sees first. And if they're going to run into something, they're going to run into that trailer that's leased by the Michigan Department of Transportation. And if it gets damaged, it gets replaced that same day with another trailer. That's part of the lease agreement, as I understand it. That's probably the most innovative approach I've seen to uh, a temporary blocking unit at an incident scene that's not an actual fire truck. And, uh, Does that roll on every MVA? Uh, every time they go out on the interstate, they take it, yes. Interesting. Okay. Because yes. I know, and this is something we could actually talk about too, but long-term incidents, I know many areas of the country, including my own hometown, we're set up with resources that if we know we're going to be out at a scene for a little bit, um, we can make a phone call and get trailers up there that have signage and blocking devices and, and, and blinking lights and things like that. Obviously, it doesn't roll for everyday fender benders and minor accidents, but if we were going to be long-term, and that's, again, something that can be worked on in the planning stages and the awareness stages, leaders can get together in their planning and put these trailers and resources together that they can, for long-term incidents, can have these vehicles respond and, and help out uh, with better signage and better um, blocking devices and things like that. I think that's common in many areas. 
Sure, and there are a lot of uh, metropolitan areas that have safety service patrol vehicles normally operated by the Department of Transportation uh, that are on the road constantly during rush hours especially and sometimes 24-7 and sometimes only during certain hours. Uh, Their job is to provide traffic control at incident scenes. Uh, They use bigger trucks that are uh, equipped with arrow boards and uh, lots of cones, and and their job is to help set up traffic control where the fire department's busy doing other things. And, of course, in the Northeast, you have fire police officers that can do the same thing, Uh, and many fire departments who have active fire police officers have now started to design and build their own fire police vehicles to respond as an emergency vehicle like a safety service patrol truck to an incident to provide temporary traffic control with uh, arrow boards and variable message signs in some cases and cones and flares and whatever else they might have available to them at the time with the personnel to do it. Um, now, you told me something attitude. earlier that I, I wasn't aware. When you mentioned fire police, I know what you're talking about because we have them in my area. You educated me earlier in our earlier conversation before we went on the air that there's many areas of the country that don't have fire police. Do you want to explain to our listeners what fire police are and, and what, they're dis- what they were formed to do? Yeah, they, uh, they are members of the local fire department, uh, typically volunteer departments, although there are career departments who also have reserve personnel that do the same job. Uh, their job is to provide traffic and crowd control at emergency scenes, and many times they respond in their own vehicles, uh, which hopefully are equipped with some traffic control lighting and things like that, but the trend that I've started to see now is an awful lot of the more progressive departments uh, who have realized the danger on the highways have started to design and build their own safety service patrol type truck for the fire police officers um, that they respond in at the same time the other units roll out for a call. Uh, so the idea is that your department is dispatched for a motor vehicle crash um, on the throughway or whatever the case may be, not only Hopefully do you have law enforcement there to provide traffic control, but you'll also have a fire police vehicle or vehicles with temporary traffic control devices, arrow boards, sometimes variable message signs and things like that to help set up as safe a scene as possible for those folks who are doing extrication and fire control or whatever the situation may call for. Um, Last time I think we checked, Tom, there's about, about 20 states, I think, that we found that there was some sort of a uh, fire police officer, or auxiliary officer, or reserve officer. They use different names in different places whose job is to provide temporary traffic control at incident scenes. And it's a great, it's, you know, again, we could spend a whole show on recruitment, retention, and different roles and jobs for keeping volunteers. What I have found in my experience, it's a great role for somebody to maybe transition to as they're they're getting up there in years, and I'm not saying every fire police officer is an older member, not at all, but it is something that for a member that maybe isn't going to be an interior frontline firefighter anymore, they can certainly still be a valuable member of that department, not just behind the scenes administratively and helping out around the firehouse, but still at calls by assuming this type of role. And and I have a personal experience in my own family with my brother-in-law, who's a member of a local volunteer department near me, who, as he got older, he's in his 60s now, decided I can't be a frontline interior firefighter anymore, but what a valuable member of his department he still is by assuming a fire police role. Sure. And I, I mentioned before that there are some career departments that have personnel that do the same job, Um, I'll use as an example the Loveland Sims Fire Department in Ohio. Our friend Billy G. is out there as deputy Mm -hmm. chief, and he has what he likes to call his emergency services unit on steroids that do a variety (laughs) of different tasks as volunteers for the career department. And one of the things that they help with, as I understand it, is with traffic control at some of the incident scenes. Uh, They're trained and equipped to be able to provide assistance for the department on those job functions that uh, frees up the the other personnel to do what needs to be done at the incident scene itself. Wow. Well, Jack, we've been talking for a little over an hour now, and uh, if anybody would like to call in, you still have time. If Jack doesn't mind, there's a few more things I'd like to talk about. And uh, you certainly can call in at um, 760-454-8852. And we certainly encourage you to call in. If you have any questions, we'll be talking 
with Jack Sullivan for a little bit longer, if, as long as you got the time, Jack. Uh, as long as the battery on the phone holds out, I'm good. <laughs> Excellent. I'm on my house phone, and I know some of you younger firefighters are probably like, what's that? Because I looked at my cell phone, it's down to like 12%, so I think I'd be I'd be <laughs> dropping soon. But I got a question for you, and this is something that comes up every now and then. I'd like your opinion on it. Should we be bear- wearing our fire helmets on these incidents? Is it is it... Is it uh, at least a chance to help limit a head injury if, God forbid, something fly off the road or or you're struck? Well, I would tell you, again, that's an area that uh, we'd sure like to have some studies on or some research or whatever. We don't, and I would tell you that uh, my feelings are from anecdotal information uh, that started with the incident on the Pennsylvania Turnpike that I mentioned at the beginning of the program. Um, I believe that some of our members uh, felt that because they were wearing their helmet that day, they did not sustain more serious head injuries uh, when they were struck at the incident scene and knocked to the ground. If they had not been wearing their helmets, we're pretty sure there would have been some more serious incidents or injuries, and uh, we may have lost additional people. I don't know. It's hard to say at this point. Yeah. Um, it can't hurt. But it, it's, <laughs> no it, pun intended. Well, you know, it, can it? it's one of those things that uh, our advice is that you should be wearing your headgear at an incident scene uh, for for a couple of reasons. One is the potential to protect your head in the event of an impact of any sort. You may not be hit by the striking vehicle itself, but you might be hit by debris or something like that. And it also improves visibility. Uh, Your visibility to motorists in the area when you're wearing your helmet, it's one more piece of the puzzle to make us more visible to motorists who are passing by the incident scene. Um, As you know, with the... um, reflective markings on the helmets they show up at a distance especially at nighttime Uh, you take your fire coat off and still have your bunkers on and your helmet you can still be visible from a distance before you get your vest on if you're switching things around that helmet serves not only protect your head but also to improve your conspicuity as we call it your ability to be seen by others in in the immediate area (laughs) yeah and and wear your chin strap because the helmet coming off after your hit isn't going to protect you. And I used that was one of my pet peeves as a command officer on the fire ground. Put the chin strap on. <laughs> and you're still fighting so. that battle, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's like the vest battle. And we do pretty good with the fire service on wearing a vest. Where, where we're lacking in our area, and I mean, don't disrespect anybody, is getting law enforcement buy-in. For some reason in our area, we do not have a lot of law enforcement wearing the high visibility vests. Those that get it do, but boy, are there a lot that do not. And of course, who are we to tell them? We can just try, like we do with younger members, we can try to lead by example. Well, and I would tell you that uh, we've taken that problem on head on. We've been uh, given some grant money from the law enforcement community, and we are just about finished uh, with a learning network module on um, law enforcement officers and high visibility garments. Um, and we used law enforcement officers and state troopers from around the country as the content experts when we put this together. So it wasn't done by uh, just firefighters by any means. We have a number of uh, state highway patrols that have been involved in the development of the module and uh, who are helping us to address this particular situation. And the agency that provided us with the funding for it recognizes it as an issue and thought that we were in a pretty good position to help them. Um, It's going to be one of the first learning modules that we've put together that is of interest outside the fire and EMS community. So um, we're not quite sure how it's going to be received, but it's almost ready for prime time. It should be uh, out on the street in the very near future. Fantastic. That's good to hear because, again, all this added up together is what's going to limit our chances of being involved in a highway tragedy, and uh, and uh, hopefully we can make some headway by getting everybody's buy-in uh, on wearing the safety vest. And, and as you said, I'd like you to repeat that again for listeners that maybe are just joining in or just to reiterate uh, the common sense factor. We're, we're, when this all first started and we started having this awareness more 10 years ago about wearing vests doesn't mean as there's a fire raging that you're struggling to put a high-visibility vest on, right? Right. The uh, NFPA and the... Uh MUTCD, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and OSHA and everybody else involved now recognizes that it's more appropriate for firefighters to be wearing NFPA-compliant fire gear when they're addressing uh, fire, heat, flame, or hazardous materials at an incident scene. 
and um, it's no longer required that you wear the high visibility vest at that point if you're going to be in proximity to those hazards. But at the same time, we want uh, pump operators who might be attending the pump panel. It's something they should be wearing in the way of high visibility gear. Once the fire is under control and extinguished and you're doing mop-up or clean-up at the scene or uh, putting equipment back on the truck or whatever, it might be time to switch over to something that's high vis, especially if you're going to take your bunker coat off and whatnot. I think all of the standards, codes, regulations, and laws are now in sync with that, and it's well documented and well talked about, and it shouldn't be an issue anymore. Absolutely, and and I'd like to say, too, for those companies, and there's a lot of them out there, that maybe let their personnel respond in private vehicles. Um, We give T-shirts away constantly in our fire service. We're all wearing our local volunteer fire department T-shirt. If possible, give vests away. Issue everyone their own vest. I'm hoping that we discourage personal vehicles on highway calls like interstates, but I know it happens. I know we don't do it in my area, but I know it happens. I'm hoping we discourage that, and and Jack, I think you'd agree with me. But we're going to a lot of vehicle accidents in parking lots and and side streets and things like that where members may come in their own personal vehicle. still important to put a vest on. Let them keep it in their trunk. Agree? Uh, yeah, I would say to keep it in the cab or the uh, the passenger area of the vehicle instead of in the trunk. <laughs> Just Grab so it on the way out the door right. and put it on right away instead of going to the rear of the vehicle <laughs> and scrounging for it in the trunk. Um, one other thing I would suggest, that is Tom, with my teenage daughters, they'd probably end I, I don't want to think of where that vest would end up as they borrowed the car <laughs> one night. But <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Uh, one other thing I would tell you is that uh, we, we heard a success story this past year from a uh, fire department out in Kentucky a volunteer department who was successful in applying for a fire grant to um, get the funding to provide high visibility markings on the back of their fire apparatus, older apparatus that they retrofit with high visibility markings. The grant paid for um, variable message sign boards to mount on the top of the apparatus, and it's my understanding they were also able to provide all of their members with high visibility vests from the grant money. Uh, so it's important awesome for your listeners story. to know that uh, the fire grants um, can be used for those safety items also. Um, so there's possibility of getting things done. If you're stuck because of the financial piece of it, uh, put in for a fire grant. Maybe you'll be successful in being able to get the money to do some of these things. Great idea. Great idea. Because, again, all of these things that we're talking about cumulatively will help limit our chances for a highway tragedy. Do you know, Jack, another thing that comes up from time to time, is there a standard for lane designations? We get into left lane, right lane, middle lane. I've heard um, one, two, three. Um, What's recommended or what would you recommend or is it up to the individual jurisdictions for lane designation? Well, we do have some recommendations. There is no law or standard on what we call roadway terminology. But uh, we got that question a lot in the last 10 years, and uh, a group called the National Traffic Incident Management Coalition put together a document, um, a terminology-type document for roadway incidents. It's available for free in the resources section of the respondersafety.com website. Um, I I would tell you that uh, uh, what it does is recommend plain English, to describe your lanes on your roadway, if that's appropriate. It's very easy to say right, left, or center lane if all you have is three lanes. You have a right shoulder and a a left shoulder, or some folks refer to it as the inside and outside shoulder. Um, But there are plenty of areas in the country where there's more than three lanes of travel in any one direction, and then it gets a little bit tricky to use plain English. So if you have four lanes... And you're so right. I, I like that. Plain English. Plain English, sure. That's uh, that's ICS and NIMS type uh, lingo right there. We want to use plain English if we possibly can. But I've been told about roadways uh, in in certain states. Texas, I'll use that as an example. I've never been on it, but I've heard about the Katy Freeway, K T Y, and uh, maybe some of your listeners are familiar with it. I understand there are several areas on that highway where there's more than 12 lanes of traffic in any one direction. Um, and you've got to be able to tell incoming apparatus where you want them to position when they arrive at the scene. Right, left, and center lane's not going to cut it. So That's the recommendation, 
No, they uh, they recommend a numbering system starting on the left hand side of the roadway. What we used to refer to as the high speed lane would be lane one, and then moving to your right, it's two, three, four, five, six, etc. Um, but again, Tom, this is one of those things that has to be talked about ahead of time with all of the different yeah. agencies that you're working with. Get uh, everybody in agreement. Make sure that they're all using the same terminology, um, and make sure that you train all of your personnel throughout all of the organizations and agencies to use the same language and terminology. Um, there is a document to give you the guidance on that, that is what the national recommendation is, but it is not a standard code or regulation. It is up to the individual departments and agencies and regions to do that. Um, all we do is provide some guidance. If you're looking for a system to use, this is the guidance that we recommend. It, it's uh, the and, you know, I've, been, I've heard document. stories... I've actually heard of numbering systems that went the other way, from right to left. And I had a real problem with that because of merging lanes that come in from the right. Now what? Does that become one or a negative one? It, it baffled me. So, um, well, But it's either, important either that everyone gets talking okay. about it. Either system's okay. The key is, is everybody using the same system in that region. And uh, when right. we polled the states around the country, uh, what we found was, with very few exceptions, most police departments, law enforcement agencies were using the numbering system from left to right, which is why we adopted that when we put it together probably about six years ago. Okay, yeah. Wow, so much good information, so much more we could talk about. And again, folks, you're listening to Fire Engineering Talk Radio. I'm Tom Merrill, and you're listening to tonight's installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, where in tonight we're talking about strategies and tactics for ro roadway incidents, which we go to every day. And we're lucky to have Jack Sullivan on with us tonight, who just has so much information. And, Jack, uh, we, c we could talk so much more on it. And, and I do have a couple more questions, if, if you don't mind, and, and things we can talk about. And we, we're mostly, when we think of roadway incidents, we're thinking about motor vehicle accidents. And uh, one one thing I learned pretty quick, and, and it's an awareness thing, and, and, and I wonder if anyone out there has any stories to share, but I think about the vehicle fire. And before we put water on the fire, we may line everything up perfectly, be safe, have blocking vehicles, but we still have one, two, three lanes of traffic going. The vehicle that's burning is off, say, on the right shoulder or on the left shoulder. But oftentimes what responders fail to think about is what happens when they put water on that fire. Visibility can drop to zero and we've actually had to shut highways down, and I'm sure other people have as well, because we thought about it ahead of time. But if you don't think about that, that could lead to a major problem. Uh, it's actually one of the topics that we talk about in the national training from the Federal Highway Administration, and we have uh, several good video clips to help illustrate that point. Yeah, I actually have our own personal video clip from one of our incidents that I'm glad we, we thought about it ahead of time because once we started putting the fire out, it was a three-lane highway, and all three lanes were completely obscured by smoke, and who knows what could have happened. But, again, sometimes easier said than done trying to trying to shut those lanes down. So things to plan for ahead of time, things to talk about ahead of time, and uh, hopefully by preparing and talking and planning and training, we can all be better prepared for these highway incidents, which, again, occur every single day and um, as a dispatcher sometimes we tell people if it's a minor pdo steer and clear get off the highway and uh is, do, you, do you have recommendations on that as well absolutely we call it move it or work it uh, that first arriving chief officer takes a look at the scene and one of the things that we encourage folks to do is um, take a look at the state law in your area most states have a law that allows um, people with uh, slight damage to their vehicle, no injuries, to actually move those vehicles off the roadway. And many states have what we call authority removal laws, that when the first police officer or fire department uh, personnel arrive on the scene, if you're looking at the incident scene, it's minor damage to the vehicles, they're movable and there are no injuries. Our recommendation is to uh, move the vehicles out of the roadway first before you actually work the scene. Um, put them in a safe area on a side street, a parking lot, or some area away from the 
the uh, motorists that are moving on the highway, and um, we refer to that as move it or work it. But part of your size up is, is this something I've got to work where it is? If the vehicle's on fire and well involved, you're going to have to work it. But if you've got right. a fender bender and the people are standing in the highway arguing with each other, that's a move it type incident. And uh, most states have a law that will either require the owner operator of that vehicle to move it or will allow the uh, authority having jurisdiction to move it for them when they arrive at the scene. We always recommend that at first. Right. Nothing nothing wrong with I mean, in the long run, people are going to be a lot safer. We had a fire once, a small fire, but it rendered the vehicle useless. We had a family. It was a, it was a van. It was a big passenger van. We had like six people in it, and um, we put the fire out. They uh, were not from the area, but they made a phone call to a local relative who was coming to get them. They were about a half hour away, and we looked at each other, and we were ready to leave, and we knew we couldn't tie ourselves up for that half hour we put them in the fire trucks, belted them in, and took the family members off the highway to a local shopping plaza to await the other family members. Some people might raise a red flag. Oh, my gosh, you can't do that. Why not? <laughs> What's worse, leaving them up on a high-speed highway where anything could happen or belting them into a fire truck that's driven by, driven by a finely trained firefighter and getting them off this highway? Uh, one of the... Uh training modules that we put together on the learning network is all about move it or work it and the different aspects of uh, how to make the decision when to move it or when to work it. Excellent, excellent. You have given us so much information tonight and um, just uh, we could probably talk much more on it. I, like I mentioned earlier, we didn't barely touch the surface on like long-term incidents and things like that. And I, I just want to let you know um, aside from butchering your name at the beginning, which I'm never going to hear the end of, <laughs> I'm extremely honored to have had you on my show. I had a chance to read your articles and, and, and look at your information, and it's helped me out. And, and I thought I knew some information on highway safety, but you've opened my eyes. You've given me more training ideas, and um, I, I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about the subject and give it some more visibility, so to speak. Uh, it's not. It's it's what I call one of those subjects that's not very sexy in the fire service right now. It's not something that appeals to the combat-ready firefighter that we hear so much talk about these days. But I got to keep reminding those combat-ready firefighters that somewhere along the way they got to step out of their apparatus, and uh, we hope they get to the building that's on fire. Unfortunately, we've got far too many examples of firefighters being struck as they dismount from the apparatus. Um, we need to make sure the combat-ready firefighters are actually able to go combat the fire by getting out of the traffic and in, uh, into a safe area. And uh, this is one of those subjects that affects everybody that responds to an emergency in any kind of vehicle, chief's buggy, ambulance, fire truck, brush truck, whatever the case may be. And uh, we will take any chance we can to uh, highlight and make people aware of the hazard and some of the uh, resources that are available to them at no cost. And and as you said earlier, just uh, creating this awareness is huge. And I, I used to tell my people, just assume that they don't see you and assume that they're distracted and assume that you have to do everything in your power to take precautionary steps such as we talked about tonight. And if you don't mind, I'd just like to quickly review some of the big things we talked about just uh, before we sign off here. But, uh, again, I think first and foremost, Jack, awareness, awareness that – we're going to go on these calls probably in most departments a lot more often than we are the fire emergency or the more the more attractive combat-ready firefighting uh, tactics that we need to employ. We're going to need these skills and employ these tactics on high, for highway safety probably in most departments a lot more often than we are the other type of uh, skills and that that we need, which are still very, very important. I'm not downgrading that at all. But let's be aware of this problem and let's be aware that just about every day there's near misses and other tragedies on these highways so let's be aware of that and let's meet with our local agencies and other responders including tow operators including EMS including dispatchers you're going to you mentioned earlier too Jack about all the orders and information that's going to have to be conveyed and one of the things I thought about from a dispatch end is that might require some different radio channels if we only have one channel and we've got that information to provide and there's other calls being dispatched, we're going to be in trouble. So it's, again, something to think about ahead of time. 
Absolutely. I I would also tell you that one of the uh, folks that we have, or two of the groups that we haven't talked about yet that need to be included in this, uh, the medical examiner and their office, especially if you have a fatality incident of some sort, uh, very often their response to the scene can uh, cause more problems in some cases, and the news media. Um, We have a module we're putting together right now on uh, the traditional news media that we're all used to and what we call the new news media, um, which is pretty much anybody with a uh, smartphone in their pocket and uh, things like drones and everything else are coming into uh, the situation now that's making our job even more complicated as as each day goes by. So (laughs) there's a lot of different aspects to think about and work into it. And and after this awareness and after hopefully we've had some good quality meetings and good planning sessions, we're getting people cooperating and collaborating and coming up with common terminology and some common standard procedures that are going to be implemented. Now we find ourselves responding as the first in officer, and we need to be doing a proper size up and describe to incoming units via dispatch what you see what the best positioning for the vehicles in is the accident where they said it was going to be um what lane designation are we going to use where do we want people to park and uh and do the safety block where we park at an angle and not straight to better prevent an, a vehicle from lurching forward or struck from behind to make it look like it is a blocking vehicle more than a traveling vehicle. So many things to be aware of for that first in responder. And, and, and another thing I thought about is when you mentioned very early on about is the accident even where people said it was going to be, that happens quite a bit. People sometimes don't know if they're going east or west. They think they're going in one direction. They're going in another what what I like to do sometimes or recommend is when you go on these highways, if the accident isn't where they say it's going to, where it should be or it was, stage the apparatus before you have all these vehicles coming into the high-speed highways. If possible, in our area we can, stage them off the interstate until you find where the accident is and give proper directions on how to get to the accident. Agreed. Yeah, we just don't want all those vehicles coming down to where there might not be an accident, and then the accident is discovered somewhere else, and now they're all trying to get there at the same time. It can be a big mess. It can be a dangerous mess. So another thing to think of, another thing to communicate, and another thing to be aware of. So work that into your training. Review your SOPs after you develop them on a regular basis. And... uh be aware of the importance of blocking. So much so much good information. Be aware of proper scene lighting and turning high beams off and maybe other emergency lights. Great thing you mentioned there about pop-up aero boards and the availability of grant money to help with the restriping of apparatus and putting high visibility markings and boards on on the back of apparatus. So much good information there. I love uh, the idea of new apparatus being manufactured with night lights and and daytime lighting. I think a a switch on that. We need to dummy it down for us dummy firefighters and make it as easy as possible. So night and day. I like that. (laughs) So Good. um, So much to be aware of. And is there anything else before you uh, say goodbye that... uh, You'd like to get uh, get through. I, oh, I I know what I need to mention, and, and that's those websites again, because uh, so much information for our listeners on RespondersSafety.com. Resources galore, 15 modules, and what's the magic word, Jack? It's free. 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 <laughs> if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, Jack, how can they do it? I'm sure there's lots of questions for you. Uh, the easiest way is by email, RespondersSafety at gmail.com is the uh, easiest way to get in touch with me because I move move around quite a bit, traveling around the country and uh, teaching and working on this subject. Um, and uh, if you uh, need something and send me an email, chances are I can attach something and send it back to you to get you a better answer for whatever it is you're looking for at the time. Oh, sounds great, people. Please feel free to, to reach out to Jack Sullivan and uh, use his expertise to help you out and uh this has been a great show. You've given me so much information, and hopefully we, again, reiterated and and reaffirmed the awareness we all have to have as first responders about these dangers on, on the highways. And uh, 
And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on tonight. I know it was short notice, but much, much appreciated. Oh, thanks for the invite. We're uh, happy to have the chance to spread the word. Excellent. If people want more resources, it's uh, your email address. It's also respondersafety.com. And uh, is there any other sites that uh, would have information for our listeners? Uh, We've linked all of the sites that are related to this particular subject off the respondersafety.com website. So there's a whole section on links. And the resource section has gobs of information, documents, reports, studies, line-of-duty death investigations, and all kinds of other things that uh, are related to this. So a training officer or a safety officer is motivated to put together some training on a program like this. Uh, There's PowerPoints that are on the, the website to download for free. And, of course, there are the Learning Network modules that are available. Each of the Learning Network modules has a handout that can be used and has references to all kinds of other material that's out there. We've tried to consolidate everything we know about this subject on the website and make it available to everybody at no cost. Oh, that's fantastic. Free, people, free. Lots of great training ideas. It's important. And uh, one of our local fire coordinators who's well-known, Tiger Schmittendorf, has a saying. It's a great saying it's a, when he talks about highway safety. And it's, uh, his saying is, the, the job we do most often, the most dangerous job we do. Something along those lines. And it's so true. It is so true. Yeah. We need to be Tiger's aware. Been and, a big and, and help in, uh, he's been a big help in helping us put together a couple of modules recently, too. So he's involved in this uh, effort as well. Oh, fantastic, and he's a local product, and I'm going to have him on a future show talking about one of his other areas of expertise, which is recruitment and retention, which is a huge area in the volunteer fire service. But for tonight, it was about highway safety and uh, something that maybe isn't as glamorous as talking about combat-ready firefighting, as you said, but equally as important and equally as dangerous and something we probably go to more often. Jack, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Sure, you're welcome. And uh, anybody that needs any additional information can get me at respondersafety at gmail.com or through the website. Excellent. Excellent. Check it out, uh, listeners, and uh, feel free to reach out to Jack Sullivan. And again, Jack, much thanks, and I hope I meet up with you someday soon. All right. And as we like to say in the business, watch your back out there. Excellent. That's a great way for you to end it. Thank you so very much. All right, what a great show with Jack Sullivan, who just had so much information to share, uh, a renowned expert on highway safety, and I hope we did a good job delivering the message of how important it is that we're aware of these emergencies, we're aware of the dangers, we're aware of the cooperation and collaboration we need to do with all the other responders, all the other entities that are coming to these calls, tow operators, even the medical examiner, the press, because it is so, so dangerous operating on highways. But there's so many things we can do to help protect ourselves. The wearing of the vest, the parking properly, communicating clearly, and uh, hopefully you'll take some of this information. You'll check out the information on the website, respondersafety.com, and reach out to Jack Sullivan at his email address for additional information. And speaking of highway safety, Um, We talked earlier a little bit about driving safety, and my next show will be in September, and I am hoping, I've mentioned the last couple of times that we may have him as a guest, on September 8th I have Mike Wilbur tentatively scheduled to come on. For those who don't know who Mike is, he's a renowned expert, well-known around the country, around the world, a former FDNY firefighter, and he's, uh, he's an absolutely excellent speaker on the subject of driver driving safely an emergency apparatus and we're going to talk about things we can implement in our volunteer firehouses to help put together good driving programs and the awareness we need to have that we can't just put people behind the wheel of a vehicle without training them properly so that will be on september 8th and um, if that doesn't work out but as of now he, he he can make it i want to let you know before i sign off 
some of the other shows that I have scheduled or planned, but I don't have exact dates yet. I got a lot of good shows coming up, and uh, I look forward to you joining us and uh, calling in and, and sharing your ideas. But in addition to the driving safety, um, we're going to have a show maybe more when the weather turns bad again, which hopefully is not for another six months, on storm emergencies and what we can do to prepare our communities and prepare, prepare our volunteer firehouses to adequately be prepared for storms. And I'm hoping to have some national experts on preparing for storm emergencies. Um, we're going to do a show on ladder operations in the volunteer fire service, whether you have a ladder truck or not, as well as a show on engine operations in the volunteer fire service. And for the engine operations, I have uh, FDNY firefighter Timothy Klett, um, who's a lieutenant in 88 engine. He's going to come on and talk about engine operations, and we're going to twist it a little bit as to talk about how we can make our volunteer fire department set up to handle engine operations uh, to the best of, of their ability. We're going to do a show focusing on grant help and how we can apply for grants and what resources are out there. I mentioned I'm going to have our local uh, speaker, Tiger Schmittendorf, who's well-known throughout the country, to talk, come on and talk about recruitment and retention. I also have another local uh, past fire chief of a neighboring department who is in charge of group home safety, home for developmentally challenged individuals. We're going to do a show talking about group home fire safety and things we should be aware of when we're res responding to these group homes or homes with uh, dis disabled people in them. A former Buffalo Fire Commissioner, Mike Lombardo, is going to be on a show. Mike was also a, uh, in addition to being a Buffalo Fire Chief and Commissioner, he was also a volunteer member of many local departments. And we're going to talk stories. We're going to just simply talk stories about the volunteer fire service as compared to the paid service and the similarities and the differences and share his wisdom. And he also has a great presentation on red flags on the fire ground. We're going to talk about red flags we should be aware of. Now, this is more for those meat and potato firefighters out there. We talked about the combat ready firefighters. You'll enjoy that show. We're going to do a show on physical fitness. I have a couple guests lined up to talk about things we can do in our volunteer firehouse for physical fitness and recognizing the importance of physical fitness as we talked about earlier. Um, I have the Wizard of Water lined up for a future show. His name is Dennis Laguerre from California. He does a fantastic talk about what we need to know about hoses and nozzles and how to get the most water out of hoses and nozzles. And he did a show um, that I listened to a while ago, and it was just fascinating. And he has agreed to be on a future show. Uh, I have a show scheduled on the history and traditions of the Volunteer Fire Service. And that's going to be scheduled, <clears throat> excuse me, at, at a later date as well. So lots of good things coming down the piper. I, I really appreciate you joining me tonight to talk highway safety. And two other things before we sign off for this evening. I always like to take the time to remember some of the significant fires that maybe occurred during the month of the show I'm doing throughout fire service history. And when I sat down to research July, I could spend an entire show on tragic fires and very influential fires in our fire service history that happened in the month of July, and, and starting right with July 1st in 1988 in Hackensack, New Jersey, where we lost five firefighters who were killed when a bowstring rust roof collapsed at, a, at the Hackensack Ford dealership. This is the poster child for the dangers of bowstring truss roofs and it's something that should be researched and we should educate our newer firefighters about this fire out of the memory of these five firefighters who were killed and also to prevent this from happening to future generations of firefighters but that bowstring truss roof collapse in Hackensack New Jersey was on July 1st 1988 and it doesn't end there I could spend as I said an entire show on it on July 6 1944 in Hartford, Connecticut, the Ringling Brothers Circus, Barnum and Bailey Circus, suffered a tent fire. He had about 7,000 people packed into a tent to watch the circus, and unfortunately, 169 died. That fire started behind some bleachers. Circus workers tried to control it with buckets of water, but unfortunately, the top panels of the tent were covered with a mixture of paraffin and gasoline, which helped waterproof the tent. And once fire reached the top, it raced across and was helped by winds. 
and in about 10 minutes it consumed the tent. And it was 169 fatalities and still stands today as the deadly, deadliest American amusement park or amusement facility fire. Also in 1944, just a week later, July 17th, there was an explosion at a U.S. Navy port, the Chicago Naval Magazine, and 320 naval naval personnel were killed on a uh, terrible, terrible explosion um, when they were unloading some munitions during World War II. 320 naval personnel were killed just a week and a couple days after the fire in Hartford, Connecticut. Other fires of significance in the month of July 1975, there was a hotel fire in Portland, Oregon, killing 12 people at the Pomona Hotel. In 1931, there was a fire at a senior home for the poor uh, in Pittsburgh, at Little Sisters of the Poor, which was a home for the aged. That killed 48 people. And in 1973, on July 5th, 11 firefighters were killed at the Doxel Gas Company fire where 33,000 gallons of propane gas, which was being transferred from a rail car to a storage tank, suddenly exploded due to a blevy. And this stands as a poster child for how to handle blevy-type incidents. And I encourage you to look that up. This was Kingman, Arizona, July 5th, 1973, where 11 firefighters were killed. The Kingman Volunteer Fire Department showed up. They tried to control the fire by cooling the tank, but unfortunately it blevied, and 11 of them were killed. They didn't have the resources needed to adequately extinguish the fire, and ironically, ironically, they had scheduled training for July 11th on how to deal with these types of incidents when they had scheduled training for dangerous cargo shipments, which was to occur July 11th. But it was six days too late because on July 5th there was a terrible blevy and we lost 11 brother firefighters. The month of July has seen terrible refinery fires, including one in 1984 in, in Romeville, Illinois, which 17 people were killed and there was $177 million in damage. And in 1956 at the Shamrock Oil and Gas Corporation in Texas, where 19 firefighters were killed at a terrible refinery fire. What usually happens during July, it's usually hot, it's usually dry. There's also been horrible, terrible forest fires during the month of July, including July 6, 1994, the Storm King fire where 14 wildland firefighters were killed on Storm King Mountain in Colorado. And in 1953, 15 firefighters killed in California fighting a fire in the Mendocino National Forest. Just back in 2001, there was a 30-mile fire which started as a small picnic cooking fire, July 9, 2001. That was in the Okanagan National Forest in Washington. It was a big, big fire, and unfortunately, four firefighters lost their lives in a forest fire. Terrible month for refinery fires, for forest fires, for hotel fires, for fires in the home for the aged, just a terrible, terrible month, including today is the anniversary, July 21st, 2007. I'd like to dedicate this radio show, since it happened on this date, to the two Contra Costa County, California firefighters who lost their lives on this date in 2007 when they were caught in a flashover as they tried to rescue a couple from a burning dwelling. You know what? It was a routine call for help that quickly turned into a tragic disaster. Four lives were lost, including two Contra County, California firefighters. When they died at this one-story ranch home, they did manage to pull one victim from the home, and they were trying to find the other. When, unfortunately, they perished. And that happened on August or July 21, 2007. Many more fires, many more tragedies that occurred during the month of July, including one in my own hometown on July 4th when a Buffalo firefighter was killed by the name of Michael Sequin in a fire due to fireworks. And there's other stories, other examples. And when I bring these up, it's A, to honor them, 
B, to remember them. Three, to pay respects to them. But four, I want to say to you volunteers out there, anybody listening out there, use these as examples of how we can get better. Go on to the NIOSH website. Google these fire service tragedies, these fire service stories, and implement lessons learned in your training programs. That's the least we can do out of honor for them. People, it's been a great show. We've been on for a long time. And as I do every show, I'd like to end with my annual shout-out. And it's a group of fire departments this evening that I would like to pay recognition to from the great state of Kentucky. There were many volunteer fire departments in the county of Henderson, in Henderson County, Kentucky, who saw their budget slashed due to tough economic times. These volunteer fire departments usually got about $20,000 to help in their operations, and it was cut to $7,000 due to tough financial times. But these volunteer fire departments are still working, still responding to calls, still trying to do what they can do to help their communities. And I'd like to pay homage to the Cairo Volunteer Fire Department, the Henderson Fire Department, the Hebbardsville Area Volunteer Fire Department, the Zion Volunteer Fire Department, the Niagara Volunteer Fire Department, the Basket Fire Department, the Cordon Civil Defense Fire and Rescue, the Reeds River Volunteer Fire Department, the Roberts Community Fire Department, the Smithville's Volunteer Fire Department, and the Spotsville Volunteer Fire Department. Eleven county fire departments from Henderson County, Kentucky, who saw their usual $20,000 stipend from the county fathers be stripped to $7,000, all due to tough economic times, due to a budget cut that was about $2.5 million. But are they still going to go to calls? Are they still going to help their community? Are they still going to respond and do what's needed to help anybody in distress? Absolutely. That's the spirit of the firefighter, and that's definitely the spirit of the volunteer firefighter. And I'd really like to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show. We had so much great information provided to us tonight from Mr. Jack Sullivan, and I really want to thank him for tuning in. Again, my next show will be September 8th, and I hope you can join us then because I guarantee it will be another great show. No matter what the topic, it will be a great show. So thanks for listening, and remember, being professional has absolutely nothing to do with earning a paycheck. It has everything to do with delivering competent and compassionate service and taking care of not only our customers, but certainly our own members as well. This has been Fire Engineering Talk Radio, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. I'm Tom Merrill. Thank you so much all for joining me tonight, and we will talk to you again in September. Take care, my friends.